Um, so hi everyone, I'm super happy to be here to chat with you all today. And I'm gonna talk about um, practical AI systems and effective human AI collaboration. This is basically a big umbrella of what I'm interested in and also what my students have been working on. Kiro mentioned um, our collaboration on large model for clustering. I will also mention that briefly. Um, I think BJ, um, the student will also come and give another maybe more extensive talk just on that topic. Um, throughout this talk, please feel free to just stop me at any moment if you have any questions um, or want to chat about anything. Um, so let's get started and um, start by talking about what everyone is talking about these days, this general purpose AI systems. Um, I think it's really hard to miss this big trend of everyone is trying to build general purpose models that, that can practically handle everything um, from maybe search to um, intelligent math tutors to data analysis support in Excel and a lot of other cases. Um, their global performance are pretty much amazing. Um, for example, right now, um, they achieve probably better um, results on a lot of um, standard exams compared to me, or like GRE or a lot of um, English exams, they're better. They're definitely doing better than me. But we as the users, we still care more about their local performance on our own use cases. So it doesn't really matter if the model can win like first place on biology um, Olympic. If it suggests, for example, research papers that do not even exist during my literature review, then it's probably not useful for me at all. And um, eventually, we are always part of this use case. Whenever we interact with models, we submit a prompt. It's always up to us to do the verification of saying like, oh, is the model giving us something useful or is it even true? Um, can we use it for some of our actual purposes? Um, so like large model being general purpose is super amazing. It basically means you can map it to any of the use cases that you care about. But at the same time, we face this big issue of like, how do we actually assess and tailor general purpose models for more specific use cases when um, they're collaborating with humans? How do we make sure all of these mapping actually are compatible with what we actually want? And like, um, how do we make sure these specific use cases are optimized and not just a general performance? So my group, um, try, we try to build practical NLP systems that are compatible to human goals. And that generally links to two different um, questions that probably are a little bit obvious from the motivation part. Um, first one is how do you actually map general purpose models to a special purpose um, and make sure the model is still having a reasonably good performance on that gen on that special purpose that you're interested in. And the second one is um, when you do that, that mapping, how do you make sure you're mapping it to the right task so that the model can, can give you the right support and you're also comfortable of using the results from them or checking the results from them or like collaborating with um, these models on this particular tasks. Um, so these two, uh, actually be the focus of my talk today and I will basically dive into each of them a little bit and chat about um, some of the recent explorations we are doing in the space um, and some of the interesting questions I think would be um, useful to answer um, and eventually talk about some of the future work. So the first one, how to map general purpose models to specific purpose. Um, I will develop, uh, de de uh, divide this into two subsections, one on model testing and on one on kind of model distillation, but also more like um, model training. Um, they each represent a small sub question. Um, first one, is this large model actually usable for my case? And the second one, can the model be consistently usable mm -hmm. for the case that, I'm care that I care about? Um, so the first one will be centering around this paper that we submitted to EMLP called um, Beyond Testers Biases, Guiding Model Testing with Knowledge Bases Using Large Model. It's led by um, the student Chen Yang um, that I'm collaborating with another faculty at CMU called Christian. Um, so before we get into that particular project, a big recap on model testing. 
Um, at this point, um, I think it's pretty standard um, to say like everyone probably agreed that aggregated devaluation is not super enough. Um, things like accuracy could miss a lot of um, particular dimensions of the model performance that we actually care about, like maybe um, robustness or like um, um, being able to uh, respond to some of the reasoning uh, reasoning requirements that we have for the model. And instead of having just one score to represent the whole model performance, it's probably useful to actually break down and have more nuanced analysis to make sure the model is behaving correctly or expectedly on a lot of dimensions that we actually care about. For doing this, um, several years ago, um, prior to the large model um, era, we presented, uh, we proposed this paper called Checklist. Basically, it's a framework um, trying to apply the principles for software engineering testing to NLP um, and try to create test cases for specific phenomenon behavior. Um, there are several, basically we try to um, ground the te model testing on things that we call capability, basically just different um, things you would want your model to um, be capable of handling. Um, some of them are really just linguistic based, really standard across a lot of models, like whether you're building a dialogue system or you're building translation system or sentiment analysis system, you would always want to make sure your model can identify named entity or it can be reasonably sensitive or not too sensitive to things like negation, blah, blah, blah. So how do you define test cases for each of them? Um, this is kind of like a final result um, of like example test cases. Um, for example, if you want to uh, test your model on whether it can handle some kind of hard negation, for example, um, negation of positive with some neutral stuff in the middle of the sentence, um, you can use either templates or some generators to get a list of um, examples that has the, ha have the particular phenomenon that you would actually want to test. Like here, um, you will have a lot of examples in the form of, I wouldn't say given that blah, like given that I'm from Brazil, that this food was extraordinary. It's basically just adding something in between to break the sentence structure at some preposition to make it more complex so the model maybe won't be able to handle this. You can define tons of test cases um, for all of the different capabilities that you want to test about. Even just for negation, you can have really simple negations like just not or like um, not neutral is maybe still neutral. And I thought something was positive. It's actually not positive. Um, and if you summarize everything, you basically expand a single accuracy that you usually would just rely on into a table of accuracy that has like um, the columns being all of the different capabilities that you have tested the model on and the columns, um, the rows being all of the capabilities and the columns being all of the different ways you have tested them on. And then with the failure rate, you can have a more um, sophisticated and fine-grained idea of where your model is feeling more compared to some other places. So checklist handles fine-grained testing on model behaviors that users actually care about using these capabilities or model behaviors or concepts that we want to test about. Um, this whole concept is testing becomes more important um, when everyone right now is building their own NLP models just with prompting. Um, but where do these requirements come from? Um, in checklist, the way we try to guide people was just say like all of the models have some grounding um, linguistic capabilities that maybe you should test first on. But in this, um, in this world where tons of prompt um, are produced every day, um, each person has a very specific requirement of what they want their prompted NLP model to handle. And it's not just as simple as, oh, I want negation to work, I want this to work. It's really much more task specific than that. Um, how do we really help people to get to that point that they can collect all of the requirements that they think are important for their cases? So let's... Um, walks through a little bit of like what people would do in real life if they just test models, try to test models on their own. Um, if we have a space of model behavior and say um, I'm a requester or like I'm a tester trying to see if my model can handle 
um, detection of online toxicity. Um, I can first think of some requirements or some types of um, toxicity that I want my model to be able to capture. Maybe I covered hate speech and I covered discrimination. And I created some of the test cases and quickly realized, oh, there are discrimination towards specific groups, maybe um, LGBTQ group or like religious people and under religious people. Some people are more um, vulnerable than others and are more easily attacked, maybe Muslim or um, Christian people. So this is a really valid path to um, to capture a lot of model behavior. And this is what a lot of people will do. It's kind of driven by um, people's own domain knowledge and also what they have observed in their existing test case. Basically, if you observe something, it's likely to be wrong. You try to dive deeper. But what happens here is eventually you will end up with some like um, local explorations. Here you will cover a distinct space of, um, maybe small space of hate speech, but then all of the other uh, explorations that you've been doing will just be around discrimination, which is a little bit maybe too local um, if we see the whole space of like what we could have covered. Um, in this particular case, we would have missed things like misinformation, which is also counted as toxicity. And also harassment is a big thing that we probably didn't get to test just because we weren't able to think of it at the first place. And then we never really see test cases that would lead us to that. So we really want to have more comprehensive testing, but it's not something um, humans or practitioners will be able to arrive at on their own. So how do we move from local exploitation towards more global exploration? Um, checklist and all of these test model testing process have borrowed something from software engineering, like unit testing, a lot of different testing methods. And we end up uh, at this local exploitation space. And in order to um, get this more global or um, more general exploration, there's something else we have to borrow also from software engineering, and it's called vModel. It's a very standard and um, traditional model in software engineering that basically tries to make sure that each test can be traced back, back to a requirement and all requirements are tested. Um, the most important part is really the requirement analysis or elicitation helping software engineers to realize um, as they're building their software, what are things, uh, what are the things that they really want their software to be doing? Um, so that that is kind of called requirement analysis. And um, basically this is what we want to migrate um, into an LP model testing. And for that, we built a, mod um, a system called Weaver, trying to support users requirement elicitation for guiding model testing by providing some um, comprehensive knowledge beyond individual test testers biases. Um, so this is a general workflow. So uh, basically you will, uh, the human will start with some seeding um, concept for, for this, it probably will just be whatever task you're trying to perform, like maybe online toxicity. Um, and with this seeding, um, seeding concept, we basically want to um, collect a lot of existing other contacts, concepts that are really relevant and will be useful for testing. And um, the way we do this is try to collect a knowledge base from large model. Um, the intuition behind this is um, large model have parametric knowledge for various domains, tasks, and topics. Um, they can help guide users. And um, it is important to extract the knowledge really comprehensively and to get that, we really want to use some more like traditional method of build, building the knowledge base to make sure like you do not just say, oh, what is useful for online toxicity, which will also, the model will give you some kind of bias to result. So the way um, we do it is we try to curate large, large model for topics or concepts um, relevant to testing um, using some concept net relations. Basically, we. Um, paraphrase all of the a lot of relations in the concept net definition into natural language that can be used to prompt the model. Like for example, we can say list some ways to do online to toxicity, and then the model would say oh harassment, cyberbullying, and um, we do this for multiple different kind of um, 
um, relations, we will get a lot of different things that would be relevant to our central seat concept in different ways. Um, like manner of we covered, and there's also type of um, online toxicity, like hate speech, racism, uh, spreading misinformation. Um, and there's also the secondary level of, um, for example, hate speech down to disabled people, immigrants, or religions. So just with really simple prompt, um, growing out this knowledge space, we will be able to easily cover the space uh, more comprehensively or more quickly compared to humans trying to write this on their own. After that, um, this is a comprehensive graph, but at the same time, it's also a very um, overwhelming graph. So at the same time, we also have to do some recommendation and trimming of this graph or knowledge base. Um, so we try to recommend some relevant and diverse topics to humans in a tree structure that they can really easily um, browse, uh, browse through and also expand if they really want to. Um, basically, the way we do it is using some greedy peeling algorithm that's standard in the um, graph um, problems. And if we pair this um, concepts with some example generation, um, probably also powered by large models, then we can basically always enter a topic and say, now I want to test um, misogyny, for example, um, to say like, if my model is able to detect this kind of um, online toxicity, and then the model can generate a list of test cases that fall under this concept, um, give us a pass-fail score, and eventually help us almost automate the whole testing process of discovering which particular concepts seem to be um, not performing well enough so people can refine their prompt. And we did some evaluations on whether um, the Viber recommendation is actually used um, comprehensive or like uh, cover all of the important things that people would care about. Basically, we collected some gold ground truth concepts um, from a lot of different tasks um, from literature, um, where a lot of experts um, have analyzed the task really thoroughly and said, in order to um, perform this task well, these are all of the um, different model phenomenon that has to be covered and make sure like they all work really well. And we compare, we use that as our ground truth and compare the recommendation from Viper to that and um, found that um, pretty much they cover most of the important concepts, even when we only grow the knowledge base to the second layer. And a lot of the things that we didn't get to cover was um, either just more fine grained things that we will be able to cover if um, human just decide, oh, I will go one step further and one level further. And there are also some other concepts that's like the interse intersection of some of the concepts that Beaver recommended. So it's also possible for people to just find those um, based on the recommendation. So it's actually pretty comprehensive. And then in um, actual user testing, um, compared to just trying to summarize concepts after seeing model errors um, iteratively, which is kind of the standard way of doing things, um, Viver helps identify um, 50, more than 50% uh, more concepts in the same amount of time, uh, basically helping you um, exploring a lot more things. And more importantly, these concepts really fall under different clusters. So it's not really e local exploitation anymore. Um, this is kind of a visualization of um, how the um, different clusters might look like for people doing in the control group. Um, for example, when they do trying to understand if the, uh, uh, if the model can detect um, sentences or documents relevant to climate change, and they usually just have a lot of exploration on effects on humans or animals or sea animals versus uh, for people in fever, they cover many more things. Um, let's spread it out. And as a result of this exploration, they were even they were also very easily covering or identifying much more fa um, failure cases. So it's very good for model debugging and also for um, determining whether the model will actually be useful if we decide to deploy it into the wild. 
Another thing to notice is this general trend of how things are growing. Like um, for the Viva group, um, it really enables users to continuously discover some distinct um, concepts versus in the control group, basically, eventually people saturate and cannot really hit more class distinct clusters, even though they are trying to identify more concepts that are just maybe slightly different from each other. So some takeaways here. Um, one thing I think is becoming very interesting is like prompt plus large model kind of just represent a task specific model. And whenever you iterate on the prompt, it's a little bit like um, in the traditional NLP when you retrain with a slightly different hyperparameter and then you get a new model, um, but still for the same task. It's just easier to create different versions of tasks these days. Um, and to test these models, it's kind of more essential to figure out requirements, um, which are what um, practitioners actually need, especially because um, all of the people who are less from um, much less familiar with the traditional definition of like linguistic or traditional definition of NLP capabilities, they come in and they just care about things um, relevant to their own tasks. Large language model can actually support these task specific knowledge and supply these knowledge. Um, so it's kind of a, a like large language model testing large language model scenario. It's interesting, um, but generally the higher level thing is really surfacing and augmenting task specific knowledge among the sea of knowledge for practitioners is really an important feature. And with that, I want to also discuss a relevant project that's also um, basically trying to say like how to get domain specific knowledge from models and make sure it's usable. And this is in a context more of like um, model distillation and um, trying to get a more stable special purpose uh, model out of the large language model. And this is something um, we submitted to MNLP um, 2023 demo track and we will be releasing the paper and the code um, probably next Monday, so stay tuned. Um, so large language model plus prompt. There are a lot of good things um, of this that we actually also covered some of them before. So it offers really easy proof of concept prototyping. You can just um, write or like build an NLP system in seconds. You just need to state your intent and a prompt and done. And if you want to get a different one, you just rewrite your prompt and then be done in another second. Um, it really democratizes the access to AI systems. Anyone can do it in natural language. Um, but at the same time, um, practical deployment is still really difficult. Um, you're pretty much handcuffed to enlarge the model. Um, you have to use that model to like use the prompt to get whatever result you need to get. And it's really slow and cost a lot of money per API call. Um, you don't really have a lot of control on the model behavior because the underlying large language model can change any any time and it's not always communicated to the practitioners. Um, evaluating, fixing the model is kind of near impossible because of how unstable prompting is and also how unstable or uncontrollable the underlying large language model is. And submitting private data to API can also be concerning. So there are just a lot of things to both um, while we like large language model, there's a lot of things to hate about it, I guess. And that backs the question of like, can we keep the light lightweight large language model prompting interaction, but train special purpose models that is conductive to deployment? And that is what prompt to model is trying to do. Um, it's a framework for automatically training special purpose models based on natural language prompt by collecting and synthesizing task specific knowledge through multiple channels. Um, so this is um, also a workflow um, of the prompt to model um, general framework. And uh, this is just showing the input and output. The input should just be a prompt, just like how you would prompt the large model. Um, here we are, it's using like um, closed book 
QA as a task uh, demonstration. So the input will be like generate an answer, physically describing the task, generate an answer to a natural question. The input is a string that consists of both a question and a passage. And then the output is basically um, a, a trained model that you can use the um, input uh, format that you describe to the model and then get an answer. And then the model, um, it will also give you a score of like how good your model will be performing. So the steps um, that prompt to model take in order to go from the input prompt to the output model um, is basically it collects task specific knowledge through a lot of different channels. Um, the first one is um, data set retrieval. Basically, we try to discover and retrieve annotated data relevant to the task. Um, and we use um, data set binder that mm, we built before um, to match the prompt to user descriptions on a lot of different data sets. For this particular task, um, what data, data set retriever will find is a children's book test, which basically have the same input and output format um, to teach the model, okay, basically what is the general mm, type of input that you will be receiving. And the second one is kind of the more core um, knowledge uh, retriever, I guess. Um, basically try to distill internal knowledge from large inch model. Um, we use large inch model to generate pseudo labeled data representing large, large inch model behaviors. And we try to improve the diversity of this generation and also the quality of the generation by uh, just generating multiple batch and iter iteratively select some few shot examples um, differently in different batch and also adjust the sampling temperature. So basically when you just get started, you want things more, um, uh, has better quality and maybe slightly more deterministic. So you will have maybe lower temperature. And as you go, you want to explore a bit more and your few shot examples are more stable already. So you can go a little bit crazy and then turn the temperature um, higher. So it's like pro proportionally turning the hyperparameter to get better results. Um, and the last one is um, also getting some kind of parametric knowledge by retrieving um, some pre-trained model. Um, the way to do it is kind of interesting. Um, so we use large inch model to actually also take the prompt and generate a hypothetical model description. Like if you were to train a model and host it on Hugging Face, how would a model description look like for a model like this? What's the uh, expected language, for example, if it's not specified in a prompt, usually you would just say English. Uh, what's the licensing, um, tag, whatever. It's basically just generating a description that looks like models on Hugging Face. So we can use this to um, search um, on Hugging Face what models would be the best one to use by doing some embedding comparison. For this particular task, it will give us Flan T5 base, uh, which is a 20, uh, 250 million sized model, and it will have the relevant domain and language and task. Um, and the way it, we use these knowledge is basically the retrieved and also the generated data will be used together to fine tune the retrieved uh, language model and also a subset of the data will be used for validation to see like which model, if we train multiple versions of the model, which ones would be the best to select and actually deploy. And that's how we get to the final model. Um, we evaluated prompt to model on several different tasks, um, squad, the closed book QA and um, a Japanese to Python code generation task, and also a temporal expression normalization task. And we find um, prompt model really produces models that can outperform GPT 3.5 by 20% on average performance, um, while being 700 times smaller. But um, sufficient knowledge is kind of the key. One of the ta on one of the tasks, the Japanese to Python generation, and the performance is not as impressive um, because um, there are two reasons that we think would be are important. One is um, the large model 
really didn't generate a diverse set of non-English data for this data set. It's basically always um, find a maximum in column or something like that. So it's not super interesting. It's just maybe Japanese is not a language that large model has learned um, as well as English. And also we didn't find any retrieved uh, model that's trained on Japanese and code. So it's either missing the language that we care about or missing the domain we care about. We also try to do some coloration, um, correlation analysis on the model's actual performance on the actual test data versus on the retrieved plus generated data, and we see really high correlation. So for models behaving really, really well on the actual data set, it's actually also behaving really well on the data that we are using. So um, this correlation is promising because that says you don't really have to train your model with actual training data. You can just use this combination of retrieval and generation to simulate what probably will happen in real life. So similar to Vifer, um, prompt model worked because it really surface and augment task specific knowledge. Um, for Weaver, it was trying to um, provide practitioners with some abstract relevant concept. And for prompt model, um, it's more about embedding um, uh, embedding the knowledge in some noisy but really on-topic on examples. And sufficient knowledge um, is a combination of prompting plus a lot of scaffolding from maybe more traditional approach. Um, for Viver, it was concept map was kind of the very one of the important supporting scaffolding that we used that actually made it successful. We really tried. Um, if we didn't use that, if um, the suggestion would be um pretty uh meaningless, I guess, for practitioners. It's just cover things people can already think about. Um, versus prompt model is basically prompting strategy to get large model. Um, data points, but at the same time, it's really also getting some relevant um, information or knowledge from retrieved data and also retrieved um, model compared to just using noisy um, large model generated data. So the rough answer to the first question is um, doing um, well thought knowledge elicitation and actually helping practitioners doing this is kind of important for actually getting this mapping from general purpose model to special purpose. Okay, um, the second part I will um, discuss a little bit about is how to map models to the right purpose so they're helpful. Um, in the first part, we're always um, assuming like we just want this model to do this particular task in this very specific way. But that's actually not the case in a lot of um, tasks um, because large models is very versatile. It can be framed as any task um, that you probably wanted to perform. You can do anything with it. Um, it's actually very interesting and probably um, a lot of people have kind of ignored like how important it is to find the right task for the large model to ac actually perform in order to have the most effective use of it. And I just want to demonstrate um, that some of the work we've been doing on um, trying to compare large models taking different roles in the same task um, and also how large, large models um, perform in those different roles compared to humans. So this one is actually uh, the work um, we talked about, like the clustering one and collaborating with Kiro um, and Caitlin and also um, Graham and BJ at CMU. Um, so I will go briefly about this, but if you're interested, um, probably there's another talk later on this directly. Mm. So this is kind of a um, case study on like um, how learning model can be used in different ways for the same task. Um, so the general task here is semi-supervised clustering. You have a lot of different um, points. Maybe it's text documents that you want to group by topic, or maybe it's entities that you want to make sure, even though they're in different format, um, um, you can claim they're referring to the same person or same place, or they're totally different, even though they're in the same form. So a lot of the um, 
clusters, all of the nodes in the embedding space. And we do some kind of um, comparison and clustering iterate, iteration on it, eventually putting them into some groups in an unsupervised manner. Um, so my supervised clustering basically invites humans to come in and give a lot of feedback to this process to more specifically define oh, what actually we want to come out of this clustering algorithm instead of just asking the algorithm to um, define this uh, blindly, I guess. And so we always have the same goal of improving clustering results with human feedback, but it can be Im implemented in a lot of different ways at different steps of clustering. Even before any of the clustering exists, um, we can already improve what input feature we want to use in order to do that cluster. Humans can define that. And during clustering, you can always have humans to do pairwise constraint to say, oh, these two documents, they have to be together. They cannot be together. And after clustering, you can also do post correction to say, oh, it's generally correct. But for this one point, I want to move it to another cluster. So can large model do the same? Is one form of feedback better than another? Um, we try to test this with this large model assisted clustering work. I'm trying to explore and compare different ways of using large model for the task of providing feedback to clustering arcs. Mm, so I'll just really briefly go through the three ways. So before clustering, we basically use large model for key phrase expansion. Um, given the input context, humans will write a prompt to say what task it's doing. Um, this one is uh, trying to cluster online banking query based on the intent. And then large model will try to generate some task specific key phrases for this, um, basically the intent. And then we concatenate the embedding for cluster, uh, for clustering. So it, this embedding compared to just embedding the text data, this will have um, more specific information on what we actually want to do with this um, text. And then during clustering, it's um, kind of the traditional way of doing pairwise constraint. Humans can give us some example of the constraints and then large range model will just generalize and try to label more constraints in a few shot manner. And then after clustering, um, there are, for the points that are really low confidence, um, large model can be used for post correction. Basically, um, find those cases um, based on probability and then um, re ask large model to say, oh, is it closer to this other cluster? Um, the representative examples in this other cluster? If yes, maybe we will do a final uh, reassignment. Mm, so, some of the results uh, based on our evaluation on um, two entity canonicalization task and three task clustering task. Um, key phrase expansion before clustering is very efficient. Large model can locate and expand useful contacts pretty much everywhere. Um, pairwise constraint, if you have a lot of them and all of them are kind of um, really useful or like high quality, it will also be uh, very helpful. It can achieve uh, for example, for the Twitter data set, the pairwise constraint accuracy is like 98%. And then the basically we achieve state of the art. But for this banking statement um, intent clustering, uh, pairwise constraint didn't do as well. And so the overall performance was also lower. Um, Post correction, as can be expected, it caused some minor oscillation. Um, just around its performance without any correction, just because it's a final step and it's also a really local step. Um, it's always only post correcting 1% of the data or like up to 10% of the data. And um, the change is always really final decision. There's no wiggling room um, for this. So it's either you make it correct or make it incorrect. So there's always an uncertainty of how well it will do. Um, and a key takeaway here is really the usefulness of the same large model can drastically change um, depending on how the task is defined and allocated to them. And it's a little bit similar to humans. Um, task delegation and human expertise really should match in order for the humans to actually achieve good performance. Um, and in a lot of cases right now, we're trying to say, oh, 
Largest model will be part of our future and they will be collaborating with us or taking some of the um, work that we are doing. Um, so it's becoming more and more important to really study the strengths and weakness of larger models relative to humans. Um, and that's kind of another threat we've been focusing on. Um, and this is the first one is actually a course project that I find really fun. Um, and I will uh, explore, uh, explain a little bit. Second is a really small 30 second demo that I want to show you. So if we think of any task as a series of subtasks, um, we can imagine a world of human large model collaboration where we find subtasks large model can perform well on, delegate the tasks to them and handle the rest of the more advanced tasks. Um, so if we consider large models as team teammates who can help us achieve certain final goal, how do we know what roles they should take? Um, so there's something called cross-sourcing pipeline, basically breaking down complex tasks into pieces that can be done independently by crowd workers and then combine them. Um, and there are a lot of tasks um, and different de designs of um, strategies for this breakdown. For example, there's a very typical one called fix, uh, find, fix, and verify. Um, so as an example, if you want to shorten the text, um, the first thing you want the crop to uh, for a set of crop workers to do is really to find the verbose part. And then a second set of crop workers will try to iterate on each of them and shorten, shorten each of them and put them back into the original context. And finally, um, there is a verification um, task for some other crop workers again to correct any of the grammar mistakes that's introduced throughout the process. And um, it's very interesting that even for crowd workers, crowd workers has been treated as human computa computational algorithms for a really long time. And they are also prompted to do all of these tasks. These are the prompts that were given to the um, actual crowd workers, like identify at least one area that can be shortened without changing the meaning of the paragraph. And this general idea of um, subtasking has also been explored recently in large intermodal through basically training. Um, it's also breaking down complex tasks into subtasks, but now really um, being able to be done by independent large intermodals and then combined. So this gives us a pretty good platform to cross compare all of the different maybe decomposition of tasks that has been designed on the human side and see um, if we just replicate all of the decomposition with large models, can we kind of use the same context and same general application to compare how large models would perform on different subtasks and also how large, how large models perform differently compared to humans. Um, so for example, for this particular task, uh, we had students replicating it in learning model, and um, this were the prompts that they wrote. It's basically just really standard template-based prompt. So it was a course assignment for a course that I taught. Um, 20 graduate and undergrad students replicated seven cross-sourcing papers with large model chains. Um, this self-reflected on the effectiveness, possible improvement, and also did some peer grading. Um, the paper will have more actual analysis and also a lot of more details on all of the pipelines. Um, all of them can be replicated with some different effectiveness. Um, but some interesting findings is really the difference between humans and large models, and I will just highlight some of them. Mm, so one thing is um, um, humans have more anchoring bias. Um, it's one thing that is known to be a limitation of humans, but language models seem to, there is a way to ex escape that if you give them the right instruction. Um, so as an example here, there's an iterative process that um, students implemented. So basically, um, it's like always give the next crowd worker um, results from the previous crowd worker and ask them to um, do better than the previous crowd worker, like here, better and more creative titles. 
um, in the original paper of this uh, process, people said, um, the, the author said, perhaps only to the fact that crowd workers will iterate and improve upon existing ideas, the variance is lower, that people just regenerate ideas that's like, looked really similar to previous ones. Versus in the actual implementation um, replication, students find it's actually really easy to escape that just simply by saying like, um, ask for better and more creative stuff and it will just automatically get more diverse. And it's probably a side effect, side effect of instruction tuning um, because of how it's tuned on like human feedback, reinforcement learning. Um, I think preference is something large and familiar perform exact, um, per particularly well, like it really follow objectives much better than humans. So that's one thing like this sensitivity is something that can be exploited. Mm, on the other side, like humans are really easy, can easily really balance different uh, implicit information selection. Like if you see something that's contra contradicting or if you, if you see something that's like um, one is high quality, one is low quality, we kind of implicitly decide to get rid of the low quality one or do some kind of um, trade off. Large model don't do that. Even when there are conflict, it just accepts both. Like in one of the tasks um, in different sub steps, the model said first the mascot for the university is a tartan Scott. And in another paragraph, the, the mascot is an energetic owl. And when we use both the information to write the final essay, the conflict in, in conflicting information is just listed there. Um, if you don't explicitly tell the model to do this, it won't try to resolve this conflict. So that is also something like if we try to divide tasks, maybe larger model don't want to do this task or we don't we want to carefully design this task so the larger model can actually do that. Um, one more thing is humans get more scaffolding in general. Like for example, for this find, fix, verify in the find step, when people try to find the verbose parts in the actual crowdsourcing task, they use the interface and use mouse select to find the parts. So it's always key phrases that's exactly from the original document. But for large model, the only thing we could do because it's textual instruction is like, these segments need to be presented in the text and students find it not really reliable. A lot of cases will always do paraphrase. So this is also like task um, formation is kind of important for this particular case, maybe changing it to multiple choice and say like you have to choose from A, B, C, D, E sentences um, would be a better choice compared to copy pasting from the original sentence. So large models and human have differences. Good differences can be exploited and bad ones can be mitigated. Um, and replicating cross-sourcing pipelines actually is really valuable for studying like how large model can maybe become partially effective for some tasks, even if they can only take some of it. Um, real world implication is really um, we can use this to study how large model may impact the future of work and also how we can train humans um, um, in reaction to that. And this is a final 30 second video demo that I want to show on um, HypoCompass. Um, it's a tool that we're developing pretty much at the, um, it's kind of at the um, end of the stage for training students to do debugging. And the general idea is if humans are going to collaborate with larger models on programming tasks, uh, which can do a lot of syntax completion, but at the same time can generate errors, maybe the human role is switching more towards testing and debugging. And for the next uh, generation of CS students, maybe their training should actually be more towards debugging. Um, so we had this tool that um, have students play the role of a TA and help the large model student um, by debugging their code and practice debugging um, in the process. So they will write test cases and then start to help some um, students that's like large model simulated students. And they will have conversations with these students to explain like what test cases they fail and what are some um, possible explanations for that. Students, the large model student will give feedback on like, oh, maybe this explanation is incorrect. You should consider this and that. 
And um, um, eventually, if the explanation is right, the learner's model will correct its own code. And then, um, so the model, so um, students will have a sense of completion, I guess. Um, so learner's model is doing a lot of things like generating buggy solution, generating hints, fixing bugs um, based on student explanation, and then students get to practice writing test cases, test buggy solutions, and explain bugs. So it's a simulation of what might have happened um, somewhere in the future, and it's kind of interesting to see that. So the kind of answer to the second question that I have is task formation is and also the task ordering, like where you put larger model in your whole task um, is the key and comparing and um, contrasting how humans and larger models will perform on all of the subtasks um, will change how we try to collaborate with them in the future. There are a lot of more interesting works that can go into this direction, like knowledge is illustration is important, but if if during the prompting, if we have conflicts between internal knowledge of large, large model and external knowledge that people input in the prompt, uh, what will happen? We have some work on like testing model beliefs um, based on the context that we provide to large models through prompting. And then task formation is important, but is aligning with humans always the right way because humans also have a lot of biases. So we also have um, some work comparing humans and uh, large model biases to see, um, do they have some kind of complementarity there or do they just replicate each other very directly? And all of the works are led by amazing students. Um, I'm sure they will be happy to chat more about any of these projects if you're interested. And with that, I'm happy to take questions if we still have time. Orchestrating a Brighter World, NEC.